Well, thank you everybody for coming back from t-shirt sales and we are going to get uh, started. Our first presenter uh, today talking about um, AI and what computers can do uh, is Savin Livingston. So please give her a round of applause. Thank you for that. Um, so this talk is titled Moose v. Woodchuck. And I'd like to start out by asking how we got here today. Now, some of you might have gotten tickets from friends or, you know, from the com your company, but a lot of us had to go through a three-part CAPTCHA to prove that we were human and worthy of getting tickets. And the middle step in this three-part one was this, uh, my artistic vision of this page, which was words, 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 click on a moose. And there were pictures of moose and woodchucks, and you had to click on a moose fast enough to get tickets. And don't think you were clicking on that white box next to the moose. That cost me a second, and I got waitlisted. So why did they pick that? Because here I'm looking at these articles on the web that say that these networks are computers are better, faster, can recognize everything. Why? So we're going to go up. But first, we're going to ask, who am I? Like, why am I here? My name is Sam. I'm a software developer. If you would like to email me about this talk, you know what to do. And finally, I'm a person that really does want computers to be able to do tasks that I don't like doing, like driving. So, although machine learning covers a lot of topics, we are only going to really be covering the deep learning AI algorithms today. You'll also hear these referred to as neural networks because they kind of look like a picture there. Um, we're going to discuss the mechanics of neural networks, what their sort of limitations are, and how we can apply that knowledge to our problem spaces. So. Let's simplify this diagram. So what we have is numbers come in, then math happens, question mark, question mark, question mark, because who knows? They're just math equations. And then those math equations produce numbers out. So let's start at the beginning here with the numbers we put in. Anybody know what this is? Those are numbers, yes. How about now? It's a picture. <laughs> it's, it's a moose. But that's not what the computer saw. The computer got to see numbers. So what is this? So this picture here is, to, is a husky. And how did I, as a human, look at that? I was like, oh, got some ears, collar, cute little face, right? How might a computer look at it? So this is from a research paper. And what they were doing is they were training to determine between a wolf and a husky. And we're going to take away all the pixels that were not relevant to the computer's decision. What was, what was, what was it going off of? Snow is a very human, human way to think about it. Because again, what was our input? Numbers. And as is highlighted in the pink text, what was it looking for? Light colored pixels at the bottom of the image. So it is very easy for all of us to step into human explanations for things that computers do. So now we're going to get to the fun part of question mark, question mark, question mark. <laughs> Um, so we had our numbers going into this, so they go into these equations. How, how do we not know what these equations are if we're the people creating them? So we'll cover this. So what we have here is one of these neural networks. And what we're going to do is we are going to, as humans, train this network to recognize moose. And what we're going to start off with is we're going to pick our network. And you can see the green circles. Those represent weights, which I like to just think of as more numbers. And 
what happens is when it hits one of the green circles, it just does a math equation there. It can be addition, it can be subtraction, it can be multiplication. Whatever you can do with math, that is what is happening. So we start off, and we have a bunch of numbers that we feed into some math equations. And we just essentially keep feeding these numbers to the next equation. And at the end, we come out with more numbers, and we say, is that a moose? And if it's yes, we move on. So then I take my next moose, and I feed it through those same equations, and out comes, is that a moose? No. At which point, we, we essentially, these algorithms apply something called backpropagation, which makes, means the computer is going to fix the network for us. So it essentially goes back through these and changes the weights on these. How? Sort of computer math, but we don't really know what it's doing. We just can see some weights changing, and we're like, cool. And that's how you can create these and still not know what these sort of equations are. So then, if we've trained this properly, the next time we put that same moose image that we just trained on, and it said the wrong answer, and then we use backpropagation, and now it's fixed everything. So when I run it through again, hey, now my image is a moose. That's a moose. And we, we have to do this because you can see you, you have to take your labeled data, which is, in general, human labeled data, and feed it through your network to be able to get the right answer out the other side. And if we want to do woodchucks, you have to find a bunch of woodchucks through as well. So we take our labels of woodchucks, and we throw them through. And what we get out is a bunch of numbers, weights, and that's great. We now have a deep learning AI network for detecting moose versus woodchuck. So we've had numbers in. We have a bunch of math equations, question mark, question mark, question mark, and now we get numbers out. And we sh so, what do the numbers out look like? They're just numbers, right? You'll see later things that look like the probabilities, and there's lots of ways to combine these numbers to make it a value between 0 and 1. As a mathematician, the number between 0 and 1 is not a probability, but everyone treats it as such. So keep in mind, when you see things like that, it's not actually a probability. It's just a number between 0 and 1. And this one, it would come out pretty well for moose. Anybody know what happens when we do this on our moose versus woodchuck? Because we don't have an I don't know, right? Like, it has to kind of come out to be something. Now, if we're lucky, it comes out to be low sort of numbers on each of them, and we're like, mm, probably not something we've seen before. Um, but if we're unlucky, we get essentially a high value. And this thing will just be like, it's a moose. Why is it a moose? Probably one of the equations, the numbers of the hawk going through, hit one of the numbers of the equations. And keep in mind, we can't, keep, we can't have an other category. Because to get another, like, um, a node out that said, just the label of other, you'd have to essentially feed through everything forward, feed through everything that was not a moose or a woodchuck in the world. That seems, that's unfortunately pretty hard. And you might be thinking, well, does this really sort of work in the real world? And the answer is kind of, because here we have a network that's been trained on handwritten digits. So you put in your handwritten digit and outcomes what the digit is. So zeros go to zero, such. And so what happens when we put these through? Because keep in mind, it's numbers on the left. Any numbers. There's no 
you can put any numbers into these that you want. And what if I pick, pick these as numbers? Well, these are actually all like good handwritten digits, apparently. These, this network will say with really high confidence that the top row are all handwritten zeros, or the next row that's all like ones, right? And you're like, where? Like, I don't know. Maybe that's a three. Does that look like three to anyone? So the thing is, this will always, always, always get you an answer. And sometimes it will just be really, really confident. So we've talked about sort of changing, putting in sort of random inputs. What if when we trained it, we put on random labels? So this is a data set called CIFAR-10. It's 32 by 32 ima pixel images, so they're all small and blurry. And <laughs> they have different labels, essentially 10 different labels. Label zero is airplanes. And what the researchers did is they essentially trained a network just like we had talked before, threw the data through. If it got the wrong label, did back propagation to fix it. And they were able to train this network to essentially 100%, which is standard, right? Like, if I've trained it on the image, use back propagation, the next time I feed the image through, it should give me the high value at my, the label that I told it it was. But then they thought, well, what if we randomize these labels? What if label zero no longer means airplane? It means random collection of things. And furthermore, all these labels have the same sort of distribution of random items. So like bird, car, dog. And so they took that same, ne same sort of vanilla network that they used for training, and they fed through the, the images with the random labels. And they again stopped, and it was like they asked their network, so, like for this bird, what label did I tell you this was? And it was pretty much 100% came back and was like, oh, you told me that was labeled zero. It wasn't doing what we as humans might do as generalization. Because if I ask you, label, I tell you label zero is a plane, you think plane wings, plane, right? And you, you think that that's what these networks might be doing. But it also could just memorize 10,000 randomly labeled images. And yes, I would have to probably memorize those as well. But maybe it, it could also have done well on the airplane or the common labels by memorization. And so the question is, do these networks generalize when I put in a bunch of data that has, like airplanes, a common sort of like image or theme to them? And how would we figure that out. So what some people did was they looked at the output. These are from video frames. And, if, and in the back, as if you're wondering if they're the same picture twice, they're not. But they're very, very close to each other. And so they took a network that had been trained on like images that was, and said, like, what is this? And in the first frame, that is a bird with high probability. And in the second frame, it is a cat with high probability. So what did, so if we think of this as memorization, we're like, okay, cool. We didn't memorize on this exact bird. We're getting sort of a random output. But unlike where if we thought it was generalizing, there is no reason bird should go to cat. Oh, this is cat to monkey, and the first one is a turtle, and the second one is a lizard. Keep in mind, these are video frames, so these are the same sort of flow of objects. So if we take them as, as I like to think of these, as sort of memorization with 
you know, when you feed in random data, you get a random output if you haven't memorized it. These are still useful, which is, so this is one that I, I like to use because it's, even though it's memorization, it's still very useful to me. Um, so my husband was driving home. He didn't want to take his eyes off the road. And we, he needed to have me start a sous vide, which is a cooking display that has to be at a very precise temperature. And he sent this to me with Siri. And Siri thinks, please start at a sous vide at 132. And it thinks, is that a time? Is that a duration? And with memorization, that would have been the most likely thing, right? Like, lots of people say start something at, and they mean time. Because the computer has no context for sous vide, right? Like, but I looked at this and was like, gotcha. So the, t the water was all hot and at 132 when he got home. This is a really cool one. This is one for textures, upscaling of textures, right? So you put your number of textures in of your low resolution game, and then out the other end comes up a high resolution um, texture. And that's really useful. Um, and what happens when you guess a texture wrong? Nothing, right? Like, you might have to go back and fix it, but if this does 90%, wouldn't you take it? I know I would. Plus, if you want to train it, you can add more of your data, and then the next person who uses it gets to have all your knowledge and experience as well. So this is, so I've been talking a lot about the image domain, but really this is applicable because it's numbers going in, and anything you can turn into numbers is something you can use deep learning and AI on. This is the Ember data set. It's 2 million open source <laughs> executables um, and some, if you want, some pre-computed features on those executables that have um, labeled and labeled. Let me, let me put out how incredibly helpful it is to have labeled data because if you remember how we train, you go through the network and it has to come out to the correct label. Um, labeled malware or benign. And so what I want to point out here is that what the numbers are may depend on the domain. And what's important to know is what numbers you put in so you might know what they've memorized on. All right. And this is also memorization requires a lot of data to be useful. As I said, uh, <laughs> having labeled, lots of labeled data is really important to having these be successful. Um, so there's this trade-off between holding your, your data, your private data, and having these models be helpful or be more sort of robust to changes in the data because it has to memorize all of those individually. Um, so, even if you don't want to give your data up, there is a way to, you could still help by, there, a lot of times I said we were starting off with a sort of plain vanilla model, right? Um, where we just did sort of small initializations of the weights, but you could start with someone else's model, which is great because then you get everything they've memorized already. And then you can just add your data into it. And if you share your, essentially model with its weights, you've actually helped share the data that you've memorized. And finally, is it worth becoming part of the model for things like self-driving cars? Because keep in mind how much of us is pixel-based, right? Your clothing and such. And you might want to not, you might want the car to be able to recognize you as human. And especially if you don't dress like people in San Francisco, like you have a big puffy coat on because it's winter in Boston, right? And so for a framework for you to use when someone comes to your door selling AI, because they just might, um, some questions to ask yourself is, can your problem be solved with memorization, 
right? Like, is this actually like a plane where I have to identify parts, or is this more just like, hey, that's that's a texture, cool. Um, and that's part of where when you're asking what they're inputting into their network, what is the actual numbers? What did they sort of memorize on? Also, are the consequences of a wrong guess low, right? Like, it's okay. These will guess wrong if they haven't seen things before. That's fine, but it should probably be a low consequence thing when it happens. And obviously, the more data for memorization, the better. And the final thing to remember is they're not snake oil salesmen, right? Like this, they've seen the map. The thing with memorization is well, it will always look like it's working until it doesn't. And so they've seen their models work. They've seen it work on actual data, right? These, you just have to understand that it may not work for you tomorrow. So why did Shmukhan use picking between a woodchuck and a moose to prove that we are human? Because they bet on the fact that even though we uh, have probably, apparently, seen, not seen moose and woodchuck in real life, uh, that you probably could generalize what those were. And that you most likely didn't have a neural net in your back pocket for moose that memorized all the moose and woodchuck pictures. These are the references. I encourage everyone to go read them if you want. Small note that when they say generalization there, they do not mean like human generalization of like plane wings and everything. They mean like, how much can I twiddle those input numbers and not have my output label change? But I think they're worth reading. A lot of fun art. And obviously, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to email me.